we're going south as well as east and other places. Karen's giving the word that we should begin, um, or, uh, so let us do so monolingually as this is, um, uh, this part will be, but to say to everyone who is joining us from the many varied places you are, um, we are delighted you're here. Um, we being my colleague Karen and all the, our other colleagues at Elliott Bay Book Company, which is on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle in the Northwest part of the United States. Um, also with us here in Seattle, um, who will be part of this program, we're delighted, is um, University of Washington professor Richard Watts. We'll say more about him in just a moment, but occasioning this evening, um, and occasioning, um, this is an occasion, right, because this really is an effort of, a uh, joint effort of several uh, groups and organizations to have Sandra Smith, who's one of our most renowned and esteemed translators, literary translators at work today, um, she has she's with us from Minneapolis, so she's a few time zones from here. Um, but we're talking about travels, and we'll try and get her to Seattle, which is on the near near range of where she might all go. Um, but she's here um, as as I say, as one of the most distinguished translators of of work today. The um, she's worked on over thirty books of translation, and tonight, um, well, those and those include people such as Albert Camus and Guy de Maupassant. And they include a few writers she's been long at work with, um, work on in, in translations of where, where there's suddenly, and I say suddenly, the way of process of books and being published, three new translations that she has done from the French. Um, one is um, Sino, so this newly published, newly translated novel of Simone de Beauvoir, a never, never before published a book um, inseparable in English, I'll do these titles. And then um, also coming just out, um, she's probably most been most known for having translated all the novels of Irene Nevorovsky, um, including the, the one that sort of really broke things wide open, Sweet Frances, but other others along the way since, including uh, we have a filmmaker here who's working on a film of one of these, but The Prodigal <laughs> Child has just um, uh, come out and, and I believe it's the 12th book that, um, Sandra has translated of, of um, Irene Nevorovsky. And um, she's, while she's quite known for the, translating these writers who are no longer alive, she actually also has just translated a major figure in French uh, media and culture, uh, Anne Sinclair. Uh, this memoir, um, or this book called In the Shadows of Paris, which um, I believe it, it's, it's a book that looks at her, uh, looks at the Nazi concentration camp um, that was part of Paris's past. Um, Anne Sinclair is a, has been most known there as in, in France as a major television um, program host, but she's also a figure in cultural politics there. So tonight you'll hear Sandra um, read from and talk about each of these books. And I think, and then the questions that um, Rich Watts will bring to it, will both address these books, but also venture into other work she's translated in the nature of translation itself. Um, which is a very live subject. Um, as for all of us, um, Rich um, has talked about, we were talking about some of the other Francophone writers we've been fortunate to present at Elliott Bay over the years, including um, writers from the areas that are for his particular um, address or interest uh, as at the University of Washington of working on um, writers and literature and culture in the post-colonial areas of Francophone work. Um, he is the author of, of, of an earlier book called Packaging uh, Post-Coloniality and is at work on another book called um, uh, Water Narratives, Imagining Global Environmental Change in the Francophone Post-Colonial War World. That's um, in, in work and in progress. Um, so tonight you'll hear the two of them um, and um, we hope you will put questions um, along the way in the Q&A portal at the bottom of this. So if you, as you make comments is great in the chat, but it'll be easier for, um, I believe for Rich um, and anyone else that gets up helping ask questions to if they're in the Q&A portal. And I, I imagine there'll be many good questions to come from this program and this discussion. I do also wanna say, because I mentioned this also at the beginning, that this um, evening is really the work of many groups, um, who some of whom have put themselves out in the chat, um, and uh, we'll start with Alliance Francaise de Seattle, a frequent collaborator of Elliott Bay's in programs, and we're delighted to begin working with them. Um, the University of Washington Translation Studies Hub and the Departments of French and Department of French and Italian Studies 
at the University of Washington and the Holocaust Center for Humanity and um, we at Elliott Bay as well. These books um, I've held up, um, all three of them, as well as other translations that uh, Sandra Smith has uh, done are at Elliott Bay and we can take um, online orders or phone orders, or you can walk in, which we hope um, those of you who are closer to Seattle can do. Uh, I will come back at the very end um, just to say good night and thank everyone. But um, now we'll um, disappear here from the scene and turn this over to the two people whose very good hands you will now be in. Those being, please welcome Sandra Smith and Rich, Professor Richard Watts. Thank you both. Thanks so much, Rick, uh, for the invitation to have this conversation with Sandra. Thank you, Karen, for, for setting everything up. Um, and thanks all of you for being here. I, I think the, the fact that we have um, a lot of folks listening in means that translators are not quite as invisible as they used to be. Um, there, there's a famous scholarly work uh, by Lawrence Venuti called The Translator's Invisibility. And you know th this is, um, one of many efforts, I think, that, that a number of scholars and translators and, and folks in all kinds of domains are making to, um, to understand the act of translation, to understand the importance of it as uh, a, a cultural bridge. And so it's just a delight for me to be able to have uh, this conversation with Sandra to talk about the translation of the work of these three very important women authors of the 20th and, and 21st century. Um, and, and I think the way we're going to proceed is that uh, Sandra is going to, to do a reading um, first from um, Simone de Beauvoir's uh, Inseparable. And, uh, and then we'll have a, a discussion around that work and then we'll move on to Irene Nemirovsky's uh, The Prodigal Child and then finally Anne Sinclair's um, In the Shadow of Paris. Uh, and we're, we're, we intend to leave a good amount of time at the end for discussion because I'm sure you'll have questions about the works themselves, about um, Sandra's uh, rendering of them into, into English. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sandra who will read from the beginning of Simone de Beauvoir's uh, Inseparable. Thank you. And first, let me thank you for all your kind words. And it's really a pleasure to be here. I've been very fortunate to translate uh, so many books, uh, especially this year, in the past couple of years during the pandemic. It was a real um, boon for me to be able to use that time productively. Uh, and I also want to say, you may talk about this later on, Rich, but um, it occurred to me when I was preparing for this, that it's really unusual for a woman translator to be translating three books by women. Mm. And um, I, I'm really glad that that's the case. So we'll start with Inseparable by Simone de Beauvoir. And this is from the very beginning of the book, chapter one. When I was nine, I was a very good girl. I hadn't always been. In my early childhood, the tyranny of adults threw me into such raging fits that one day, one of my aunts seriously declared, Sylvie is possessed by demons. War and religion had defeated me. I immediately proved my exemplary patriotism by stomping on a plastic doll that was, quote, made in Germany, end quote. I didn't like it anyway. I was taught that my good behavior and piousness would determine whether God saved France. I couldn't escape. I walked through the Basilica of Sacré-Cœur with the other little girls, waving banners and singing. I started praying a very great deal and grew to like it. Father Dominique, who was the chaplain at Adelaide, my school, encouraged my devotion. Wearing a tulle dress and a bonnet made of Irish lace, I took my first communion. From that day onward, I was held up as an example to my younger sisters. My prayers were answered when my father was transferred to the war ministry due to a heart condition. On that particular morning, however, I was really excited. It was the first day of school. I was eager to get back. The classes, 
as solemn as a church mass, the silence of the corridors, the sweet smiles of the young ladies. They wore long skirts and high necked blouses. And since a part of the building had been transformed into a hospital, they often dressed as nurses. Beneath their white veils stained here and there with blood, they looked like saints. And I was moved when they pressed me to their hearts. I quickly wolfed down the soup and tasteless bread that had replaced the hot chocolate and brioche we'd had before the war and waited impatiently as mama finished dressing my sisters. All three of us had on sky blue coats made of the same fabric that the officers wore and tailored exactly like military great coats. Look, there's even a little belt, said mama to her admiring or amazed friends. As we left the building, mama held hands with the two little ones. We sadly passed the Cafe de la Rotonde that had noisily opened below our apartments and which was, said Papa, a hideout for defeatists. The word intrigued me. They are the people who believe in the defeat of France, Papa explained. We should shoot them all. I didn't understand. You don't believe what you believe on purpose. Could you be punished because certain ideas come into your mind? The spies who gave poison candy to children or the ones who stabbed French women with poison needles obviously deserve to die, but the defeatist left me perplexed. I didn't try to ask mama. She always gave the same answers as papa. My little sisters did not walk quickly. The gates of the Luxembourg garden seemed to go on forever. Finally, I got to school, climbing up the stairs and happily swinging my school bag full of new books. I recognized the faint odor of sick patients mixed in with the smell of floor wax in the freshly polished hallways. The supervisors hugged me. In the coat room, I saw my friends from the year before. I wasn't close with anyone in particular, but I liked the sound we made all together. I stood for a while in the large auditorium in front of the display cases full of old dead things that managed to die a second time. Stuffed birds lost their feathers, dried plants crumbled, shells faded. The bell rang and I went into the St. Marguerite classroom. All the classrooms were the same. The pupils sat around an oval table covered in black moleskin and was supervised by the teacher. Our mothers sat behind us, watching us as they knitted balaclavas. I headed to my seat and saw that the one next to mine was taken by a little girl I didn't know. She had brown hair and hollow cheeks and looked much younger than I was. Her dark, shining eyes stared at me intensely. Are you the best pupil? I'm Sylvie Lepage, I said. What's your name? André Gallard. I'm nine. If I look younger, it's because I was burnt to a crisp and didn't grow much. I couldn't go to school for a year, but Mama wants me to catch up. Could you lend me your notebooks from last year? Yes, I said. Andre's confidence and her precise, rapid way of speaking unsettled me. She looked me up and down defiantly. The girl next to me said you were the best pupil, she said, nodding slightly toward me said. Is it true? I'm often at the top of the class, I said somewhat shyly. I stared at Andre. Her dark hair fell straight down around her face and she had an ink stain on her chin. You don't meet a little girl who is burned alive every day. So I wanted to ask her a lot of questions, but Mademoiselle Dubois had come in, her long dress sweeping across the floor. She was a brisk woman who had a mustache and whom I respected a lot. She sat down and called out our names. She looked up at Andre. Well, my dear, we don't feel too intimidated, do we? I'm not shy, mademoiselle, said Andre confidently. Besides, she added pleasantly, you're not intimidating. So this is our first introduction to uh, the best friend of Simone de Beauvoir, whom she nicknamed Zaza. And that was the reason, their relationship is the reason that this book was written. 
Thank you so much, Sandra. I, I, was, um, I was telling Sandra when we talked about this earlier that um, the, there's something so remarkable uh, in the quality of this translation, because you know I haven't read Simone de Beauvoir's fiction, um, and in particular her autobiographical fiction, so *The Force of Circumstance*, um, uh, *Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter*, *The Prime of Life*. Uh, in about 20 years, it's been a long time, and it immediately transported me back to um, to that that moment when I was consuming these these autobiographical works. Uh, voraciously, and it, so it's it's quite a feat, and we'll we'll maybe have the chance to talk a little bit about how you how you accomplish that. But um, the first question that comes to mind is how is it that in 2021 uh, there is a new translation of a work by Simone de Beauvoir, a, a previously untranslated work? Now, this, this is one of the most important authors of um, the the 20th century in the French language. You know, how, how did it come to pass that um, this work became uh, known and available and, and you were able to participate in the translation? Well, the, um, the backstory of this really is that Simone de Beauvoir adopted a woman uh, named Sylvie Le Bon, who took de Beauvoir's surname. So, she was, she was named Sylvie Le Bon de Beauvoir. And when Simone de Beauvoir died, she left her literary estate to this woman. And it just came to light as she was going through the archives, I suppose, last year. This was published in French um, the last year. Uh, she found this never before published novel that Simone de Beauvoir had written when she was quite young and she wrote it about this relationship with her best friend whom she met as she says in this fictional uh, fictionalized version of their relationship when she was nine years old mm -hmm. and they were best friends until Zaza died uh, a very young untimely death I'm not giving anything away it's in the, the, the very first page the dedication we find this out and, and so she decided that this was important because it reveals a lot about Simone de Beauvoir's early relationships, which with hindsight can be seen as, as quite important for her future development and especially her future work on feminism uh, in particular. Yeah, it, the um, what's maybe not evident from the passage that you read is um, exactly how this work signals some of um, Simone de Beauvoir's subsequent investments in in feminism, in the development of you know what came to be known as French feminism. Um, do you want to say maybe a word or two about that? Like, what is it in the work that that signals some of these uh, a kind of early conception of uh, the place of women in in a certain stratum of French society? Well, the novel is set in what was then contemporary France, just just at the very end of World War One, and in the post in the middle before World War Two, and both of the girls came from an extremely conservative, extremely religious Catholic uh, family and had many, many uh, conventions thrust upon them. Uh, they did not have the freedom that Beauvoir wanted uh, or any of the young women really wanted, though some of them just fell into the conventional norms very easily. I mean, one part of the novel, um, Sylvie um, and André, they're the fictional characters who were Simone and uh, Zaza. They're talking about her mother, uh, André's mother says quite clearly, you know, it's either marriage or the convent. Those were the only two choices for them. And 
the very beginning shows you an Andre as a child mm. who's very, very confident, yeah. almost aggressively so. Mm. And the, the, the Beauvoir character, Sylvie, in the novel is absolutely fascinated by her and loves her, absolutely desperately loves her cannot really place the, those feelings as a young child. Well, especially in that context. Especially in that context, and especially at that time. Yeah. Um, and so there's this tremendous sort of powerful pull mm -hmm. towards each other, but which is more one-sided on Simone's part and at one point she actually says that if she imagines that if Andre dies, she would die as well. She can't imagine life without Andre. And what I found particularly interesting was the shift in the, in kind of the power, but the power uh, between the two women mm -hmm. shifts very gradually throughout the novel as we progress we find that Syl um, Sylvie, who is absolutely besotted with Andre, confesses this love for her. Mm. And it's a shock to Andre. She just hasn't realized this and also doesn't really return it in the same way. Yeah. And when she doesn't return it, that is a turning point. Because at that point, the Sylvie character has to accept that this is not an even mutual you know, kind of feeling. Yeah. And so she starts becoming much more independent. She still loves uh, Andre as, as a friend and respects her hugely as a, an intellectual. And their relationship really progresses. At, at a certain point, you see that Sylvie is the stronger character and actually has more freedom mm. than is you expect at the beginning of the novel. Yeah. But the other thing that's really interesting is I, I urge people to read the letters at the oh, yes. back of the novel, the end of the novel, because this uh, Sylvie Le Bon de Beauvoir actually found correspondence between Simone de Beauvoir and Zaza. And in the letters, you'll, you see that there is a far more mutual love hmm. than is portrayed in the novel, hmm. which I, I, I found very, very interesting. And there's one letter that's written by Zaza to Simone when she's only 19 years old. And you read this and you think, my goodness, this woman was brilliant yeah. to write a letter like this with the insight that she has at the age of 19. It was really, really remarkable. Yeah, you, you capture very nicely um, there the, the sort of, uh, this kind of coming into feminist consciousness that, that I think Beauvoir is trying to convey um, in, this, in this short novel. Um, one of the one of the things that's striking, um, and that I learned only in reading the the preface and the afterward in the um, in the this edition, is that in fact um, there there's a very particular reason why this work wasn't published earlier as such, right? And would you? I, I think it's worth talking about that. Would you say why that is, Sandra? Sartre didn't like it. He felt it was, you know, irrelevant and, well, Sartre felt that anything that wasn't directly related to politics or philosophy was not relevant. And this was, she was quite young when she wrote this and she was still very much under the influence of Sartre's opinion. Um, but what's interesting is that she tried, she did use quite large sections of this novel in uh, the Memoirs d'une jeune fille rangée, the uh, memoirs, memoirs of a dutiful daughter. Yeah. Large sections of it appear. Mm -hmm. um, she really was haunted by this loss, 
Mm. She absolutely adored Zaza. And it was uh, really an homage to this friend and their relationship. Yeah. But I, I, I'm really, I was really most struck by the um, constraints. Mm. I mean, you can see why mm -hmm. he, the, well, Beauvoir and other women just rebelled mm. against these constraints. Um, there's one really amusing phrase in the novel where um, her mother, Andre's mother tells her that she, you know, she's the same mother who says it's either marriage or the conduct, says to her, well, you don't have to worry. If, of course, the, the um, marriages were chosen, they were not love matches. That's no, 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 that couldn't have, can't have that. Mm -hmm. You married whoever your parents chose for you who was suitable, but they had this, um, they were told that the minute that you get married, you fall in love with the person. And they used this really amusing phrase for it, which was love at first sacrament. <laughs> so the minute that the priest performed the wedding. <laughs> yeah. A bit of a gamble. Fell in love. Right? <laughs> I mean, no problem, you fell in love. A bit, a bit of a gamble. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to continue, and we can know, we should come back on. to this um, in the in the Q and A. But yeah, we should we should move on to uh, Irene Demirovsky's um, *The Prodigal Child*. So um, here too, and I, I think it's really instructive in this case for uh, for Sandra to do some reading because the voice is so different from De Beauvoir's and just so distinctive. So um, uh, please go ahead, Sandra. Okay, well, before I start, I just want to do um, a very quick explanation of the, uh, the main character, the main protagonist's name is Ishmael Baruch. And it's actually, his name are the first two words of the novella. And just for, just to remind people who may not have, uh, I don't know, been immersed in very biblical, in many biblical studies. Ishmael was the son of Abraham and his handmaiden Hagar, because Sarah, Abraham's husband, was thought she couldn't have children. And then in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Sarah does get pregnant when she's about 90, I think. It's a very odd passage and gives birth to Isaac. And she's so jealous of Hagar and Ishmael at that point, and feels that Isaac is a legitimate son, that she forces Hagar and Ishmael into exile, they leave. And Ishmael becomes, if not a prof, if not the founder of Islam, a prophet of Islam, whereas Isaac becomes the one of the forefathers of Judaism. So that's very immediately you hear Ishmael, and that's you think Bible. And then his surname is Baruch. And Baruch, for those who may not be familiar, is a Hebrew word. And it is it means blessed. And most Jewish prayers start out with Baruch Adonai, which is blessed are you our Lord. And so you have this tension immediately that Nemirovsky creates in her protagonist, where he's both cast out and blessed at the same time. Okay, so um, I'll read this shorter passage for you. And it takes place, I mean, she just describes at the very beginning that it's the Black Sea in Southern Russia. We, we imagine this is really Odessa, um, though she doesn't actually say it, right? Ishmael Baruch was born on a very snowy day in March in a large trading port on the Black Sea in Southern Russia. His father lived in the Jewish part of town, not far from the market square, where he sold old clothes and scrap metal. 
He still wore a threadbare caftan, oriental slippers, and the short side curls called payas, as was ordained. His wife helped him with his work and bore his children. Over her hair, which had been shaved off on the day of her wedding, as commanded by the law, she wore a curly black wool wig that made her look somewhat like a dark complexioned woman whose skin had been bleached white by the rain and snow of the North. She was a hard worker, no more frugal than necessary and well-mannered. She remembered the happier times of the past for her father had been a rich money lender before they burned down his house during a pogrom on the Easter Sunday after the assassination of Emperor Alexander II. The only thing Ishmael's mother had left from her former opulence was a pair of gold hoop earrings that were more precious to her than her sight itself. They jingled with a bright mocking sound as she came and went in her creased stained dress made of printed cotton, cleaning the house, washing the floors on Friday, or cutting the black bread and cloves of garlic into very small pieces, which she would feed to her household. Her family grew larger every year, for children multiplied like insects in the Jewish quarter. They grew up in the streets. They begged, argued, swore at passers-by, rolled around half naked in the mud, ate vegetable peelings, stole, threw rocks at dogs, fought, filled the street with an ungodly clamor that never ceased. The Baruchs had 14 of them. As soon as they were old enough, they left for the port where they did all sorts of odd jobs. They helped the longshoremen and porters, sold watermelons they'd stolen, begged for alms, and prospered like the rats that scurried around the old boats along the coast. Once in the clutches of the town or the sea, such children rarely returned home. Many of them left on the large ships loaded with cereal and grains headed for Europe. But most of them died young. Epidemics among the infants ripped through the Jewish quarter, sweeping away children by the hundreds. That is how the Baruchs lost half of theirs. One of their neighbors, a carpenter, would nail together a few boards as a coffin in exchange for an old pair of trousers or a dented saucepan. The mother would weep a little, undressing the little body and laying it down in the new box that smelled of pine sap. Baruch would carry it under his arm to the Jewish cemetery a sad enclosed plot of land where graves without crosses lay close together, a place where flowers never grew. Soon another child would be born to replace the one who had died, wearing his clothes, taking his place in a corner of the old straw mat that served as a bed for the whole family. Then he would grow up and go away as well. When Ishmael was about 10 years old, he found himself alone. He noticed that his portion of bread and garlic had gotten bigger. Then one day, his father took him to the rabbi who taught the Jewish alphabet to the children of that part of town. It cost one ruble a month, an amount Baruch would never have spent from his meager budget if he'd had other sons or the hope of having more. But he and his wife were getting older and Ishmael was their youngest. The town was either baking hot in the summer sun or freezing in the glacial winter winds. But in springtime, the wild free waves of the sea were infused with all the scents of Asia. Ishmael loved the town and the port. He also loved the market square on summer mornings with his heaps of tomatoes, peppers, melons, and the golden strings of onions twisted around the workbenches. The merchants opened the red bellies of the fish, the small green tart apples that the housewives used to make preserves marinated in buckets of salty water. Ishmael would collect bubliks that passers-by dropped on the ground, or a handful of cherries half crushed by horses. Watermelon peels were scattered all over the streets. There were barrows heaped with the ripe fruit, as heavy and round as green moons. 
people would cut them into sweet, red, juicy pieces. As soon as Ishmael had a kopeck in his pocket, he would buy one, then spend the rest of the day sucking its rosy flesh, which melted in his mouth. On the market square, you could see people of three different races who stood shoulder to shoulder, but never mixed. Russians with their long, dirty beards, kind eyes and simple faces, each with two or lar three large features that made them look like white wooden toys. Their orthodox priests with the long straight hair of Christ and peasants in cotton blouses, merchants in silk smocks. Then the Tatars, their heads wrapped in turbans, who never spoke much and were content to simply silently offer the buyers their trays full of nougat, Turkish delight, Armenian incense. And finally, the Jews, dressed in their grease-stained greatcoats, talkative, obsequious, hopping about like old birds, wading birds without feathers who understood everything, knew everything, sold everything, and bought even more. So that's the beginning of the prodigal child. Thank you, Sandra. Um, it's it's really quite remarkable um, that this this story, like the the previous one we were discussing, was written by um, a very young author. I mean, in the case of De Beauvoir, she, if I understand it correctly, the version that you translated was. Um, revised and, and you know, augmented when uh, Simone de Beauvoir was in the, the sort of height of her powers um, as, a, as a writer in the 1950s. But this is a work that Nemirovsky produced when she was 19, is that correct? Twen yeah, 20, yeah. Okay. 20. Um, and, and one it really... the, it's one of the first things she ever wrote. Yeah, yeah. And, and the voice, um, I mean, you, you sense it in the pages that you read, and I, I, I read through the entirety of the translation. Um, the, the voice and the, the sort of uh, grasp of, of how narrative works is really um, quite mature, right? It's, it's quite striking. Um, so I, I, I want to ask you about two different things in relation to this translation. I guess maybe the, the place to start is um, how your, your experience as a translator of Nemirovsky uh, informs your work on you know, each subsequent translation, because this is your 12th, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. and you're working on a 13th. <laughs> uh, I mean, this sort of sustained engagement with one author as a translator is pretty rare, right? Um, and I'm just wondering how uh, how each translation perhaps builds on the previous one or, or, or how, um, how your work as a translator is impacted by the fact that you've just become so intimately familiar with this author, with her work um, at various stages of its development. Well, I, I think the most interesting thing um, about working on so many Nemirovskis is that I translated the last thing she wrote first. <laughs> And that's very rare for an author, for a, a, an audience, a readership, hmm. to read the last thing someone wrote first. Because when Sweet Francaise was such a success, the French publishers decided that they would haul out all of her backlist right. because she, she published, she was very prolific and she published a novel every year from 1929 right until she was murdered at Auschwitz in 1942, yeah. uh, up until about 1940, because the laws against the Jews came in then and she wasn't allowed to be published. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, her complete works are two volumes which comprise about 4,000 pages in that short time. She was very, very prolific. Mm -hmm. So I translated the last thing she wrote first and then we started going backwards because they started reissuing the backlist from the earliest work, 1929, David Golder, mm. right, and then went chronologically. Mm. Um, and now I've gone backwards again <laughs> to the first thing she wrote. So um, they're all different, but they're all similar in certain ways in, in that her style. Uh, she's very, very lyrical in her descriptive passages. 
She's very uh, distinct about the voice she gives to each of her characters. Yeah. And I think, you know, you know, I have discussed this before as we both, we both teach. Um, teaching literature really helped me as a translator. Mm. Because when you have to point out or encourage students to read really well, really do close reading and look for lyricism and look for alliteration, look for different things like voice and um, the correct diction for mm. each particular character. It makes you aware as a translator yeah. that um, these things have to be carried into um, the language you're translating into as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that is the hardest part about translation, really, is being so familiar with the work mm. and noticing the distinctions and trying to find, rather than a literal, you can't find a literal, we're getting into the technique now about translation, mm -hmm. but it's impossible to do a good translation if you're too literal. Yeah. What you have to find is not the equivalent words, you have to find words that convey an, the equivalent emotional mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. I always tell my students, don't translate what it says, translate what it means. And of yeah. course that's subjective. Right, no, and, and I think, I mean, translation is, is an act of interpretation um, necessarily, right? That you can't render in a different language exactly what is being conveyed in, um, in the source text. And I, I'm just gonna go a little bit out of order here because there, there's a question in the Q&A that actually speaks to the issue that you were, you were just describing. Um, and, and so one of our attendees asks, um, given that language evolves over time, when working on a translation, how do you balance using the way of saying things as of the date the work was written versus the way things are, are said today? Um, is this, you know, you're, you're responsible in many respects for the dissemination of Irene Nemirovsky's work in the broad Anglophone world. I mean, this is a, a massive readership who came to know this work. I mean, I, I read Suite Francaise when, you're, when the reissue of it came out and your translation came out shortly um, thereafter. And it, it does open up an entire world, but there are references, there are, um, there are terms, right? And, and we'll talk about this in relation to Anne Sinclair that um, may not resonate at all with the contemporary readership. How do you, how do you handle that? Well, um, it's a fine line. You want your translation to impart a sense of the, the foreign culture mm. without alienating the readership mm. because it's too, they can't relate to it. Yeah. And the best example I can give really is the collection of short stories that I translated by de Maupassant. And I remember giving a talk about that to um, a group <laughs> at Cambridge. And I said that I had discussed with the editor that we wanted to modernize the language mm. to bring it more to a modern readership. And the title of the collection is actually The Necklace and Other Stories, Maupassant for Modern Times. Mm -hmm. And when I said, and so we are updating the language, but I'm still trying, you know, I said that. And there was a, an audible gasp from someone <laughs> in the audience. It was like, <gasps> how dare you? You know, and um, a lot of people feel that you should not tamper with the original text. But well, you have translation to is tampering no matter exactly, what. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, if you want the language to be relevant, you can't go so far as to make it feel false, you know, untrue. 
but you can use expressions that have the same emotional impact now as the original had. Mm. I mean, when I translated The Stranger, the Camus L'Etranger, I was the fifth person to translate it. And all of the versions are different. Yeah. So again, we come back to this subjectivity, but I like to leave things in like, I never change Monsieur and Madame to Mr. and Mrs. I mean, to me, that's one very small way, keeping the French flavor, everybody's gonna know what it means. Yeah. And can you imagine if it had been called Mrs. Bovary? <laughs> you know, it just doesn't very, work. Very well said. That's very, very well said. Um, again, being mindful of time, I think yeah, uh, we, we, we should move on to uh, the Anton Cloud text um, in the Shadows of Paris. Um, so yeah, I, I invite you, Sandra, to just do a, a brief reading. I'm going to do a short, uh, a much yeah. shorter reading for this because of time. But well, also, I, I, I just, just actually, to... sorry, before you do okay. that, I just want to note um, the there's a remarkable coherence uh, across these three works that that are produced by very different writers at different moments. Um, the this is a recently published book by Anne Sinclair, uh, just translated by by Sandra. Um, what connects this work to um, to the, the work of Irene Nemirovsky is that it, it deals with concentration camps and um, a, a French complicity with uh, the, the work of the Nazi occupiers. Um, and so you know, these questions of the role of women in the mid-century period during the wars uh, that Beauvoir, Nemirovsky, and Sinclair address does nicely connect the, these three works. You, you, have, you have a clear orientation, Sandra, and I know that the, the translator doesn't always pick what she does, mm. right? But you have been picked as the one who, who really should be translating um, these works. Okay, with that. I have been very fortunate. I always say yeah. I've been lucky, but I work hard. Yeah. So it's a combination. It's clear. So one thing I think I should just mention is that the word, um, there's a French word that I've kept in this text. This is nonfiction. This is Anne Sinclair doing research about her paternal grandfather who was detained in a concentration camp and managed to escape, get out just. Um, and the word is rafle, which is spelled R-A-F-L-E. And um, it basically is used to mean the um, arrest and uh, deportation of, of the Jews in the, um, during the occupation. So she's talking about her grandparents. It's, it's between 5.30 and 7 on Friday morning when Léonce and Marguerite Schwartz, my paternal grandparents, are pulled from their beds. I picture them, the four men at the door, two policemen wearing capes and caps, and behind them in uniform, two soldiers of the Wehrmacht, then under the authority of the German military commander in France. This is the accepted procedure for raffle. The French police followed by two from the Feld Gendarmerie and sometimes by Gestapo agents too. We're looking for Monsieur Leon Schwartz. The exchanges are the same in all the buildings visited at dawn. We would like you to come with us so we can ask you a few questions, the Frenchmen say, while the Germans remain silent. The theater scenery is well known, the dialogue easy to imagine. Shall we give you time to pack a small suitcase? It will only take 48 hours. You have 15 minutes, interrupts one of the Germans in correct French, but with a very strong accent. His tone of voice conveys his belief in the superiority of the occupying forces. The two Frenchmen are obviously here only to set the stage. They hand my grandfather a list of what he is allowed to take with him. Two blankets, some clothing, enough food for two days, a maximum of 300 francs, no pen or paper. Léonce, like the others arrested that morning, does not ask why they have come at daybreak. 
He goes into the bedroom with my grandmother. It is cold, still dark outside. They grab a small suitcase. Marguerite quickly throws in a warm suit, some woolens, two blankets, while Léonce prepares his toiletries and most importantly, his asthma medicine. He does not even think of fleeing. Anyway, how could he get out with the two Germans standing in the kitchen, blocking the service entrance? They do not speak to each other. Acting quickly, Léonce has no idea what to say to his wife to reassure her. Besides, there's nothing reassuring about this. A quick kiss, the same idiotic words probably said by everyone taken that morning. I'll try to get in touch as soon as I can. I can picture the indescribable smile on the face of the German who had spoken. The French police raise their caps to salute Marguerite and usher Léonce out. The Germans follow behind. The door of the building slams shut. My grandmother stands frozen to the spot. There is noise in the hallway. Apparently, Louis Engelman, who lives on the floor above, was also taken away. She dares not open the door to look. She rushes to the telephone and calls their closest Jewish friends. They've just arrested Léonce. It's a raf. Don't stay at home, she whispers. The filthy war has entered my grandparents' house. It is December 12th, 1941, and they do not know that the raffle of prominent Jews is just a beginning. Yes, um, and uh, this, I, I think that you can have had the same experience or a similar experience translating some of Nemirovsky's works. Um, but, you know, in, in the context of this, of this um, short work of family history, popular history, and just plain history, archival history, um, you're, you're really delving into some very difficult and dark uh, chapters in, in French history. Um, and something I've noticed in, in recent years is that there, there's a lot of talk in the realm of, um, especially interpreting studies, but we'll say, you know, translation and interpretation studies broadly around a kind of um, vicarious trauma, to, to put it uh, bluntly, that, that the translator might experience or the interpreter might experience. I mean, you know, think of of interpreters working day after day in, uh, you know, in, in refugee camps or in courts. Um, and, and we don't often think about this in relation to the literary translator. And I know, you know, we're not talking strictly speaking here about a literary work, but, you know, work of history. Um, what was it like for you to, to translate this work? Because, you know, the, the translator develops such an intimacy with the work that she's dealing with, right? It's it's not a kind of casual rapport. Um, there aren't lines that you can skip over quickly or passages that are too difficult that you just sort of put them aside. You, you have to dive in all the way on every word um, in the work. Did you, did you find this a, a challenging work to translate? Well, it's very emotional. And the whole reason this book is so important is because it's very emotional. Yeah. And it's about a concentration camp that most people were unaware of. So historically it's very important. But um, yes, what you're saying is, is absolutely correct. It is traumatic having to read every word and, and, and try and get the same emotional impact yeah in English. Um, it's not the first book I've done. Um, even Sweet Francaise, the letters and the annexes at the back are very important. Mm. I also translated an amazing book by uh, Marceline Loridon-Evance, which we used as the English title, But You Did Not Come Back. Um, she was uh, deported with her father when she was 15 and he was sent to Auschwitz. She was at Birkenau, which were, they were only three kilometers apart. 
And this, this book is a uh, 105 page letter to her father who didn't survive. Mm. Um, just before the pandemic started, uh, literally just, it was March 9th, I was in, in London invited to speak at a translation conference on a panel and the panel was called Translating Trauma. Mm. And this was before I had done the Sinclair book. So I was talking quite uh, a lot about the uh, Marceline book and I met Marceline. She was amazing. Um, I, I had the privilege of meeting her when I was translating the book. And I found that even though it was several years since I had translated the book, when I did a reading from it, the way I did just tonight at the very beginning, I, I basically was tearing up and my voice was shaking and I didn't expect that to happen after all those years, but it did and the audience felt it as well. It, it is very traumatic, but I have the luxury of stopping and getting a break from it, um, finding ways of dealing with, you know, the difficulty of it. But I, like many, many other translators and these interpreters in particular that you mentioned, mm. you know, we do it because it's important. Yeah. It's yeah. important for people to know these things and it's important for people to feel these things. So hopefully we can learn a bit from history. Oh, well, I mean, absolutely. And, and I think that um, the, what translation does that, you know, that, that let's say works of history or this kind of investigative work, family histories, whatever you want to call it, um, that emanate out of context that we're familiar with and in a language that we're familiar with, they do tell us things that are important. Um, but I, I feel as if um, perspectives on, on the Second World War, on, um, on the role of French officials during the German occupation, I mean, all of this has, has um, benefited immensely, has changed, in fact, as a result of uh, the translation work that you've done, especially of, of Nemechowski and, and now this work of, of Anne Sinclair, because this is a generally unknown phenomenon of the Second World War, the fact that there was this Nazi concentration camp in France, smaller than the ones in, in Germany, but right outside of Paris. And the, um, there, there, you were talking about the, your, uh, need not to, or your decision not to translate Huff, right? Um, I mean, you know, roundup is the word that some might use in English, but it doesn't have the same evocative power, right? It doesn't, it doesn't put you in the context um, in quite the same way. So yes, I mean, I, I guess, I don't know if I have a question on all this, I'm just echoing what you're saying and, and uh, reinforcing this idea that, that these translations are so important because they, they tell us this history from an embedded, intimate perspective um, that we might have trouble accessing otherwise. I, I think it's in the introduction to Ensign Kale's book, or maybe, maybe actually in the narrative itself, that, um, that she acknowledges the American historian Robert Paxton. Um, and I, yeah, I feel it's important to just make a call out on Robert Paxton's work, who really right. broke the story, as it were, on um, French complicity with uh, the German occupiers during, during the Second World War. Um, so, I think, you know, given that it's seven, um, I'm going to encourage folks to put, put some questions in the chat. Um, and while they're doing that, so any questions you have for Sandra regarding these works, regarding her work as a translator in general, regarding some choices she made, um, regarding what you heard in the passages she read, uh, I encourage you to, to put them down in the Q&A. Um, and while we're waiting for, for people to ask some questions, I did want to ask you about um, how you how you translate what's most visible to somebody who's coming to the work, uh, which is the title. 
uh, because in each case, you, you had to make some choices and it's maybe where you, know, you, you, you have to um, get as far away from the literal uh, as you might allow yourself as a, as a translator. Well, some things are difficult to translate. So going back to my belief that you have to get the emotional impact across, let's start with the, the Sinclair. I mean, the title in French is La Rafle des Notables. Now, Rafle, when you say that to a French person, immediately they know that it's World War II, they know it's that it's the Jewish people being arrested, deported to concentration camps. Yeah. All of that in that one word, that is not possible in roundup in English. And notable also is quite tricky because you know they're notable, they're prominent, they're important people. So um, what the editor and I did and hit the editor and his team, Kenneth Kales, publisher. We chose something that was mentioned in the book, but that conveys um, more the idea in the shadows of Paris because the concentration camp was so close to Paris and the subtitle, the Nazi concentration camp that dimmed the city of light. For the, um, the Nemirovsky, her original title for it was L'Enfant Génial which actually means the child genius. Mm -hmm. And then um, it was the, the prodigal child. Um, well, the prodigal, the, yes. I think it was the prodigal. The child prodigy. Child prodigy, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I decided to go with the prodigal child because I felt that there were so many biblical references in the story. Yeah. That, and, and the Ishmael Baruch as the first two words that Nemirovsky wanted us to think Bible. So, and, and it is a parable. It is absolutely a parable. Definitely yeah. a parable. So I chose the prodigal child as the mm -hmm. title for that. For the Beauvoir, it was Les Inseparables, which in French is like the people who are inseparable. That's not a great title. Uh, so I chose inseparable uh, because they were, when they were as, as friends, they were inseparable. But before we mentioned the dogs and the wolves, that was another example where in French, uh, les chiens, les loups, it seems to translate pretty easily as the dogs and the wolves. However, those who speak French know that there is an expression in French, entre chien et loup, yeah. which means dusk. It's the time of night when the light is failing and you can't yeah. distinguish between yeah. Yeah. the two. And there was, unfortunately, there was no way to do that. Uh, yeah. So sometimes it's very frustrating yeah. with titles. Well, I, I just heard a, a reference yet again to uh, Truffaut's François Truffaut's The 400 Blows, right. which is a mistranslation of Les 400 Coups, right? I mean, it's it's not literally, it's a, an idiomatic expression referring to, you know, a trial, right? Um, but The 400 Blows just doesn't really mean anything in, in English. So this is, yeah, this is a perennial problem. I, I feel like you've done, you did a masterful uh, job of it. And then in the case of the Anne Sinclair, so that the title, the original title in French uses those two words that you pointed to as being, I don't want to say untranslatable, but having such a particular resonance in the, in the French yeah. context, la rafle des notables. Um, and, and I really like what you, what you did. Um, and I don't know if this was an editorial decision or your decision, but in the shadows of Paris, in a way, you know, informs uh, a, a North American or English language readership, um, uh, you know, what, what might be more immediately important or, or understandable to them, right? That, that's, that's pretty depth there because um, that is part of what's really striking about the story, right? The fact that this, this concentration- it's so close happened. to Paris yeah. and no one knew about it. No, absolutely. Um, there, there's a, another question 
um, hear from Lauren Ransford, who, who thanks you for this interesting discussion uh, and asks about your, uh, if you do any original writing in English. Um, I, I was just having a conversation with Laura Maris, who is uh, who has finished the retranslation of Abel Camus' La Peste, The Plague, um, who also does, uh, writes creative nonfiction and fiction. Um, is this something that you have, uh, have you dipped your toes into those waters? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I'm asked this all the time <laughs> um, and encouraged by some of my friends who are here this evening watching uh, to write my own book. It, it's a completely different skill. Um, I think in order to be a good translator, you do have to be a good writer. Um, and I have written introductions to some of the books. Speaking of which, I, I have been meaning to say, the, I thought that the introduction by Margaret Atwood to Inseparable was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, and I, I, I really urge everybody to read it. Uh, it's, it's very, very good, mm. very well written. Well, but, I think you're also very busy as a translator or something. <laughs> so maybe, well, maybe you don't have time. Well, no, I, I think it's more um, an in, in inclination. Uh, I'm, I'd rather translate than, than write something myself. I mean, there are some, uh, quite a few translators who do write themselves and translate as well. Um, and kudos to them, but. Yeah. Um, Alexandra Dorka asks um, a, a really important, highly pertinent question. So um, maybe even more complicated than this question of words that are that are untranslatable. Um, when reading and then you know translating trauma, how do you how do you translate the unspeakable? Right. Um, I mean, th there there's th these works by Sinclair, by Nemirovsky, you know, even in her own way, Beauvoir, um, they're, they're full of individual and collective suffering. Um, yeah, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you contend with that? I don't wanna say how do you justify it, but how do, you, um, how do you process it? How do you work through it? You just have to do it. You know, they had to live it. Yeah. They had to live it then the least I can do is try and get that across. Hmm. And it is difficult. Yeah. It is difficult. Um, the unspeakable, I mean, that makes me think of other things. Um, instances where things now are so, you have to be so politically correct that I, I found in certain translations, um, for example, in one Nemirovsky novel, she talks about a, a ball and there's the, uh, the jazz musicians who are les negres. Mm -hmm. Well, I translate it as the black jazz musicians. Now, I don't want people to think that Nemirovsky was being prejudiced. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. at the time, negro was just the way, that was the word that was used. It didn't have any negative connotation. Um, or, or if it did, it was, uh, you know, very much a part of its, of its context, of its moment, right? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. if anything, it had a more positive connotation because the black jazz musicians went to France from America in the interwar years to have more freedom because they're accepted there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there are certain, well, when I did the Camus, this very small, short Camus, Create Dangerously, which came out last year, which was basically a lecture that he gave to a university in Sweden after he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1957. And he talks about the artist's responsibility to be political. Well, of course, l'artiste in French is masculine. Mm. Mm. And because of political correctness today, I couldn't keep saying he, because the artist in French is every kind of artist. Mm. 
mm -hmm. uh, in all the artistic fields. And so I found that when I translated that, I had to go through and change all the singulars to plurals so I could say they. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if, if that constitutes a, a sort of, you know, um, uh, kowtowing to political correctness necessarily it's, it's just it, it to me it reads as a more uh accurate rendering of yes it is because what the it, language you know right. conveys it just happens i mean it's arbitrary right the gender of nouns in in french i mean mostly not entirely mm -hmm. um but yeah d'artiste does not you know it's, it's not a gender exclusionary term it just happens to be right. masculine <laughs> right and when he says il you have to say oui. right yeah, right. But you, um, you know, I, you, that's a good, that's a good and important workaround there. A um, couple, couple of uh, other questions here. Really good one from Jack Welton. Um, and th this is a more of a kind of translation studies type question. Is there any difference in how you approach a work that has never been translated into English as opposed to text where multiple translations already exist? And you, you really, you're somebody who has experience um, with, with both. Um, right. Well, as I said, the, the Camus L'Etranger, there had been four translations published before mine. And I had always wanted to translate it because I didn't like the, the um, existing translations. Uh, I had read them and I had taught them. Yeah. Um, and I found that there were major flaws that to me, changed the meaning of the book. They weren't just little things that I didn't happen to like. They were things that I felt really changed um, what Camus intended in the book because I knew a lot about Camus. I had wanted to do my PhD on Camus. Um, the topic was turned down by Cambridge because they said that it would take me three years to read everything about him. <laughs> um, and you only have three years to write it. Uh, so I did. I started working on something else, but I really was into Camus, and I always had wanted to translate it. And it came about because I went to, I was invited to Penguin UK, who wanted me to do a different translation. I was meeting with, um, I think Adam Freudenheim, he's quite famous in publishing world. And he was the senior editor there and he, had invited me to uh, possibly do a new translation of Les Miserables. And I was in his office and I saw the, the Camus on the, his shelf and he must've thought I was completely mad. I went up and I took the book off the shelf and I opened it to the last page. And I said, do you see this? This is a mistranslation and it changes the whole meaning of the book. Mm. And I think he's really stunned. So in that case, I actually had to write a proposal to Penguin, mm. justifying and giving examples of why I need, I thought a new translation was necessary. And fortunately they, they agreed. Mm. And so I did it. Um, for the Maupassant, again, um, the, the trans, I, I didn't read, many of the other translations at all. I looked at a couple, but they were so dated and, and mm -hmm. so censored. That was another thing. Oh yeah. Um, it, it, it was astounding to me. I mean, the entire paragraphs left out yeah. because they had to do with sex. Oh, the 19th century, uh, translation of 19th century works are, are just chock-a-block with both subtractions and right. wild additions too. I mean, Jules mm -hmm. Verne, there's a translation of Jules Verne that, that subtracts many pages and then adds a, an anti-Semitic rant into a chapter where Verne himself had, had made no such references, right? I mean, right. it's just, yeah. Yeah. These things need so, to be corrected. <laughs> yes, and you know the language was very dated and uh, stilted. It was very stilted. So, um, in a way, there's not really much difference between something that's never been translated before. I mean, the only thing is that you have this 
with something that has been done before and you're reach, you're doing a new translation, you are putting yourself in a situation where someone will compare sure. and hopefully they'll like yours better, but they may not. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you're speaking, you know, in the idiom of your time and place. And I, I think that's, that's always important. I mean, especially when it's an experienced translator doing, doing that, um, it just makes the work uh, more approachable by a contemporary readership. And, you know, as, as you and I both know, when you're in the classroom, right, <laughs> and you're using translations, this is, this is really important. Um, Karen and Rick, do we have time for maybe one more question? Sure, sure go ahead. And I don't know there's one last good question there. Why not go ahead? Yeah, and, and actually, Sandra, you started to answer this question, I mean, at least in this very particular case of the stranger, um, uh, but the question from Gloria Switzer is, uh, can you talk about how you find books to translate or how they find you? Uh, what is your, your working process? And I would just add to that question, how does it change from when you are a, a kind of aspiring translator to when you are an established, recognized translator? Well, the second, your, your addition to that is a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> um, I think you have to make, make your own luck in a way, and you have to be fortunate as well. As I said before, you have to be lucky and work hard. But um, at the beginning, um, it was really my career started with Sweet Francaise because when I was lucky enough to get that commission and that was such a success, it seemed natural for the um, publishers to ask me to do the backlist. So I was very fortunate in that respect. Um, the way it often works with a book that the publishing world knows is gonna be popular is they get a group of experienced translators together and we are each asked to translate the same chapter mm, mm -hmm. and then um, those are whittled down by in Sweet Francaise in that case for example uh, it was two people in London two people in New York and two people in Toronto mm. were and then it was shortlisted and then once I was in the shortlist I was asked to do another chapter we were all asked to do another chapter. Uh, so it was whittled down that way uh, by, by the editors. Mm -hmm. Once you actually have done quite a few books and you have a decent reputation, then the publishers normally come to you. Yeah. Um, publishing houses get used to working with um, the same translators very important to have a very good relationship. I've been very lucky in that respect as well. And I've worked hard at it also in making sure that I have good working relationships with my editors and my publishers. And yeah. um, I think that is extremely important. What is the single most important thing to do for your editor to keep him or her happy? I think to make them realize that you're both on the same side that you both want the same thing. You want the book to be a good book. You want it to create a good book that will be appreciated. Um, for the translator from a reputation point of view or say, and, and, and from the publisher, obviously from a sales point of view. And um, I, I think that's the most important thing is a good relationship. Yeah, which ultimately is not so different from the relationship that an author maintains with an editor, right? So this this is another way in which the translator and the author, you know, are ultimately not so different. Um, you you create, and it's clear that you you are um, you don't produce original fiction or you know non-fictional narrative. Um, but you, you are a, a creative translator and it comes across in these works. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to now pass it back over to Rick, but I, I really enjoyed reading these and other translations of yours, Sandra. You're, you're a, um, a treasure in the oh, field. Thank you. And it's, it's really, um, it's just critical, crucial 
fundamentally important work that you, that you do. And it's also pleasurable, right? I, I take pleasure in reading your translations. So thanks for this opportunity to chat with you. Well, thank you. It's been great. And I'm very, very fortunate because I love my work. So <laughs> they say that if you love your work, you never work a day. <laughs> I, I, I would say, I think that your love has come through tonight. The comments have all been quite effusively um, praising. Most of them couched with merci. Um, <laughs> and, and, and some have had to leave as, as the night's gone on. Um, but both of you, um, this has been wonderful. I, I know if we're in the same room, you know, program in Seattle um, with our, our friends, um, such as uh, Alexandra, Alliance France, de Francaise, Alliance Francaise uh, there would be this part afterwards where you'd get a lot of, I think there's a lot of people interested in translation and translating, and you'd get more follow-up questions of both of you about that, mm -hmm. especially what Rich right. asked at the end about how this all happens, because I think um, to see books like this come to us and realize sometimes it's been such a journey just for the book to get here um, is important that you're do so important that you're doing the work and yeah. and that now people get to know about it too. So um, we thank you. I had neglected to say a few things when I was rushing off and mentioned titles at the beginning, but um, because I've mentioned Rich, of course, teaching here at the University of Washington, but um, Sandra has her own, dis you know, distinguished teaching um, time at Cambridge University um, in uh, over in the UK and has taught also at NYU and um, are you teaching in Minnesota now or is this your, your... No, I still teach for NYU okay I teach remotely for NYU okay, okay. Yes. Minneapolis is a little remote from New York but yes that's good <laughs> yes um, and um, and also to say I because again um, her work um, if, if I, I don't think I noted this earlier um, has been awarded among others the Penn Translation Prize the French American Florence School of Foundation Translation Prize and the National Jewish Book Award for books she's translated, um, among others. There have been others as well. And um, we hope you get out to Seattle sometime. Sandra, you're halfway here. Um, <laughs> uh, in, in Minneapolis. You can do a remote to NYU from Seattle too, I think. Um, one more time zone to work with. But um, thank you so much for this. Thank you for these each of these books that now people get to read. Um, Simone de Beauvoir's Inseparable, um, this is in the order we went tonight, um, Irene Nemirovsky's The Prodigal Child, and Anne Sinclair, her book In the Shadows of Paris. And um, good luck with what else comes next, because uh, it sounds like you, uh, do you have others? What's, what is next? Are you? Are well, you... I'm working with uh, Kenneth Kales again on Ka the Kales Press yeah. uh, on yet another novel by Nemirovsky. Okay. Um, which uh, is in the public domain. And it's one that I had wanted to translate in the past. And the, the publishers had done, I think, 10 or 11 by then and thought, well, you know, maybe that's enough. Um, and so now we're doing that one, but I think it's very relevant. It's coming out next year okay. in 2022, hopefully. And it's, it's called Master of Souls. And it's very relevant to, uh, it's one of the things I love about Nemirovsky. The man, even though she was writing when she was writing, all of her themes are so relevant now. Uh, this book is about immigration. This book is about how poorly immigrants were, were, were treated oh. in France um, and how corrupt the, some of the French society was, the, up, the upper classes in particular. And so it's about a doctor who, even though he's been in France for 10 years and has all his qualifications, people don't trust him because he's foreign. He looks different, he has an accent. And so he's poor and he's, he's, he has to demean himself by performing illegal abortions. And it's just so relevant to today. And the struggle of being an immigrant and trying to have a lead a good life and provide for his family and just fa facing prejudice at every turn until he decides that the only way to survive is to become as corrupt as the um, the French people. And I think you've books. already got people wanting to read this book now. Everyone's yeah, got like, it's I, don't think, I think it's I don't, a fantastic book. So yeah, I don't think it's even listed yet that we year. could. Yeah, I don't next think it's year. <laughs> Magical it's souls. Yeah, but that. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and that again, that's. The love coming through um, for what you're what you've done and are doing, um, and someone says let's talk about that one next year. Um, and so thank you 
to both of you. Thank you uh, very much to our co-presenters. Um, Alexandra has been putting good words in um, both questions, but also about the good work that Alliance Francaise de Seattle does, uh, the University of Washington Translation Studies Hub, and the Department of French and Italian Stat Studies, and the Holocaust Center for Humanity. Um, we thank you all for your part in tonight. And um, we again, thank everyone else who's attended. And we finally, and uh, most heartfully thank um, Sandra Smith and um, Rich Wells Watts for um, doing this tonight with us. It's been a great time. Thank you both. Yeah, thank, thank you all. You. It's been a pleasure. Been great. And thanks everyone for who's, who's listened. Yeah, thank you. Good night. <laughs>